Hello, thanks for joining us today. I'm Jenna. Um, and I'm here with a, with a great firm, Vincent James Associates Architects. Well, the, the current BJAA. name is BJAA. And there are three principals, not just the two of us. Right. Nathan Knudsen is the third. Sorry about that. That's right. It's good to get that out, because I think the name gets, it, it used to be Vincent James, right? It's changed a couple times. And it's times. changed, right. So let's just get it straight, VJAA, and that, there we are. And as you all know, they're the 2012 AIA Firm of the Year. Congratulations. <laughs> um, and you guys were founded in 1995. You're based in uh, Minnesota, but you're doing work all around the world and have done work around the world for quite a long time. Um, you've won numerous awards over the years. And as you mentioned, you have three principles. Um, so um, the PowerPoint should be rolling soon. We're just going to have a PowerPoint playing in the background showing some of their work, and we're just going to have a conversation. Um, so my first question for you guys is if I was wondering if you could just kind of take us back through the history of your firm, your founding, how you got started. Um, and you're based in Minneapolis, and sort of take us back. We founded the firm in 1995. I had previously started a practice, but we've consolidated with three principals at that time. And um, we are now currently, we've been upward of 24 people. We're currently 14 people, so we're quite a small firm. And we found ourselves working in a really wide range of places. And um, it's been very interesting for us. We um, have, one of the questions you, I think you want to ask is, are we a regional firm? And we're, it's, we're almost the antithesis of a regional firm because most of our work is outside of our locality. Although lately we've been getting more local Minnesota projects, most of our work previously has been in New York or Colorado or Beirut or other places. Why do you think people have this impression that you're a regional firm? Um, I, I think part we, partly because we're in the Midwest and mm -hmm. I think if we were located somewhere else, people might not see it that way. Uh, I think another is possibly because we love to work with materials, and so I think maybe there's an association with uh, the interest in craft and a regional practice. Um, I, you know, there may be a cultural sensibility within our general community. You know, I, I think we just saw John's presentation, and I see work that has resonates with Miesian tradition in Chicago, even though it's fresh. And, so I think you could say in, 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 in some ways there are uh, forces in our locality that influence, uh, influence us, but our way of working is actually to, to uh, very deliberately try to move beyond those kinds of um, uh, impulses so that our work becomes more diverse and is more connected to wherever its location is. I think another aspect is we are very interested in location and it doesn't have to be our own location to um, help us generate ideas uh, that help us uh, come up with a, a potential solutions for a project in that place that might make it feel site specific or place specific. Well obviously we want to we want to talk about some of the projects that you guys are working on and worked on in the past. Um, why don't we start with something that you're doing internationally. I think you have some a project in Beirut? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've been doing uh, in 2003 we uh, were shortlisted and invited to compete for a project at the American University of Beirut, uh, the Hostler Student Center, and we won that competition and built the project, and since then we've had ongoing projects with them, and so we've done a number of different designs and studies, and we're continuing to do work with them. What's it like working over there? <laughs> well, it's, um, it's actually a really beautiful city and an interesting culture. And um, halfway through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention this, we'll mention this tomorrow, but halfway through the construction of our major building, there was a war, and everybody left the site and for six months. Wow. And so it's been a challenge, but actually the city is booming now. It's quite beautiful and, and interesting. Do you have staff members that are permanently based there? No. Um, we, we sent someone over from our office who wanted to live there for an extended period. He was on site for much of that. Yeah, during, during construction only. Yes. So is there something under construction now? No, no. no. <laughs> I'm just under design. <laughs> Got it. What about some projects here in the United States? What are you guys uh, working on these days? Well, actually, the, another um, international project is a, oh. um, 
uh, flat water rowing and canoe kayak uh, facility in t outside of Toronto. And uh, that's for the Pan Am Games of 2015. And so that's kind of a fast track project we're involved in right now. The other thing is for the first time we have two, uh, I think our, our most important projects we've ever built in our own city. Um, we haven't done any public work in Minneapolis in the past and uh, have only done very small projects there. So we're working on a, a public library project mm -hmm. and we're also working on a new African art gallery reinstallation for the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. That's great. Let's go back to the rowing facility uh, in Canada. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that looks like? And I, maybe, I think there's some, some challenges with that project, maybe budgetary, if I remember yeah, correctly. There are, well, yeah, oh, I you're mean, talking about the Minneapolis Rowing Club. Oh, that's oh, a different yeah, rowing yeah. club. Yeah. They're, Sorry. All, they're all very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But this was, I think, 70 something dollars a square foot, and we laid the floor and as an office. It. This is the one in, in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Yeah. Okay. So that set off. Precedent. So you have a huge budget for the one in Canada, is that <laughs> no, right? Yes, okay. a huge budget. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's, it's actually a much more serious facility for competition and uh, all season set of buildings. So it is different and a much higher, ask, I mean, much higher program for it. But um, it is still a tight budget. Now, is this the one that they want to convert into yes, a yeah. senior facility afterward? Well, it's uh, one of the things that we've been noticed, you mentioned in our conversation before, you were curious about trends that we see. And one of the things that we've been noticing is that a lot of clients are looking for what's going to happen next because they're not sure. And they're looking at planning for a lot of different futures. So they want something that's flexible that can evolve over time. And this is an example, and, and I think uh, you see this a lot with uh, games facilities where, you know, for the Pan, Pan American Games in 2015, it will be there but what life does it have afterwards? And right. they're aware that a lot there's a, an aging community and, and healthcare issues, and uh, it's, it's an industrial community that has ha suffered a lot economically. So they're looking for how the community can move forward in the future and how this facility can help to trigger that. So it's gonna be a rowing facility, and then it's going to be wh what? <laughs> well, I Actually, it will continue to be a competition uh, venue for canoe, kayak, and rowing. So it, for senior it's, citizens? Well, no, for, um, for everybody, for okay. the community and for um, Canada as a whole. So it's, uh, it's a... Um, so maybe they'll build senior housing around it? Yes. It'll be yes. part of a and, larger and development? And they're looking at building a, a human performance lab that will also have a wellness center and partner with a local university. So it's... It's creating partnerships, but starting with this training facility is something that triggers it. So is, is that really challenging to have to, to think about designing something for a major sporting event and then in the long term think about it for how is it going to be appropriate for seniors? Well, it, um, you know, as I said, it, it's principally the sporting um, uh, training activities that it will be providing. So that won't change. And um, the other parts are going to be added into this, so um, that's a pretty far down the road. And when's that project slated to be completed? But in time for the games, I assume. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> We should hope. <laughs> yes, yes. And what about materials? So well, right now, we're in, we're in schematic design. Right now, tomorrow we'll be showing that project in brief and talking a little bit about what it is, but it's it basically metal structure, a steel structure and metal cladding on very sleek uh, horizontal buildings. Great. Um, do you have any other international projects that you wanted to highlight here? No, I can't think of any. So let's move back into the United States. Okay. Um, what are you guys working on right now? Well, I mentioned we're working on a, a library in Minneapolis yep. uh, in the Uptown neighborhood. And uh, it's, a, it's a public library, a community library. We're also working with the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Uh, if you know Minneapolis, one of the things that distinguishes it is we have a really amazing arts community. Mm -hmm. And we've done uh, small projects for the Walker Arts Center uh, with the Minneapolis Institute of Arts now. And, and we also uh, just won a competition for a, a public bridge plaza for the Weissman Art Museum. So we're doing more arts-related projects, which we really enjoy, and more cultural projects. One thing you had mentioned to me is Obviously, the recessions really sort of pummeled the, the profession. Mm 
Um, and we were talking about how you guys have kind of weathered the recession. And one thing you mentioned is that you've actually focused more on doing domestic work, or that's mm -hmm. where a lot of the opportunities have kind of I, I arisen. I think that it, it's actually been, we've, I, the diversity of our work really helped us because we weren't invested in just one market area. But I think for the longest time, we really wanted to do more work locally and mm -hmm. didn't have the opportunities. And then we were very busy with practicing elsewhere and traveling that we didn't really get a chance to cultivate a local market. And so when things slowed down, we really invested in that and started to do more outreach, more work locally. Do you prefer to work locally? <laughs> You mean as opposed to a 20-hour flight to Beirut? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, they have their advantages, yeah. each, each one. Yeah. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about sustainability. I know that figures into a lot of your work. Is it something that's just integrated into everything that you do now, or does it depend on your clients' needs, or is it something that you really push for? I think it's a, it's a way of thinking about architecture that has always been present in our work, which is... You know, how do you define what sustainability is and what is a value that, you know, conserves materials or has longevity or value, uh, you know, optimizing daylighting, site orientation. So it's, it's kind of, to us, it's essential to good architecture and a lot of the principles behind it and thermal comfort and kind of how you are connected with uh, the nature and light and air. And mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we do focus quite strongly on the qualitative um, aspects of what you might call sustainable design, which is what it's like to use these, the space as we develop. And um, this is the, the link to, to passive solar or passive um, strategies is, and, ver and traditional strategies is very much a part of that. So we'll talk tomorrow about um, working in New Orleans and thinking about how the architecture of that area um, grew up in response to the climate. Uh, and so much of what we consider beautiful about it is actually also an environmental response. And then there's um, an interesting phenomena is that that architecture actually feeds back into the social behavior, the cultural behavior of a place like New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, a sort of much broader view of what sustainable design is, I think. Do you want to make a quick plug for your uh, talk tomorrow? <laughs> where, where is that and what time? In I don't case know if people we want too many people there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I think it's 2 o'clock. Is it 2 or 2.30? It's 2 or 2.30. It's, and it's here in, what, is it in one of the major meeting rooms? Or? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we should know this. We, we, look we can tweet it later. Check your schedule. Well, yeah, schedule. check Twitter. Yes. <laughs> um, I, would you say that you guys have a defining style? We try not to. What, yeah, I would say we, we try not to. We have preferences and uh, aesthetic um, in, in inclinations, let's say, but we also um, are trying to uh, uh, develop um, strategies in the design process, process that actually bring out difference within each project. So, you know, very consciously we work toward a response that is unique to that particular problem. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it doesn't lend itself to a branding strategy, granted, but it does, uh, I think, make for stronger connections in that particular condition. And it's a philosophy that we have. Are there, mater are there specific materials that you really love working with? I, I think it's more, I think what we love is this process of discovery when you first start to work with something. And I think it comes back to climate, you know, where you're familiar with your own context, your own place. I mean, we live in Minnesota and it's a very extreme climate. So to go somewhere that's a temperate climate, you see all these possibilities in it because you don't have the opportunity to work with it all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in a way with materials, when you work with the same materials over and over again, you kind of miss that freshness of seeing it for the first time and wondering what you could potentially do with it. That shifting materials is really wonderful also. And I, th I think you will see a love of um, texture and grain that's associated with the building systems and details, which is kind of a recurring uh, aesthetic quality of our buildings. So, uh, you know, that if there is a the propensity to, to have a uh, taste, a particular taste, you'll see it in that, those kind of details. Do you have a favorite project? 
that you've completed over the years? Um, I think my favorite <laughs> is uh, one that wasn't built. It was the Cable Natural History Museum. And uh, it's in our book. It won a PA award a number of years ago. But it was a project that it, uh, we really rethought what a natural history museum was and how it engaged the site and was kind of interactive with the site and processing of waste and collecting and displaying of specimens. And it, it influenced a lot of our work afterwards. And I, I think we still go back to it in a lot of ways and learn from it. Is Cable the name of a town or a city? Yes, yes. Is, is it in Minnesota or? No, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. It was okay. never built. It was a Aww. small project. <laughs> and I, I think my favorite might be the, um, the rowing club, you know, the, the in, Mini in, in Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, just because the building is so simple and so clear as it, it's a barn, essentially a barn, it reveals everything about its construction. And mm. so it was really nice to work with something that minimal. And when was that completed? 2001 or two. Um, what about humanitarian work? I think you guys are doing something with Habitat for Humanity, is that right? Yeah. You uh, want to talk a little bit about that? We're working with Public Architecture out of San Francisco, and mm -hmm. they're doing a national pilot project with Habitat for Humanity. They selected four architects to try to uh, Do you know look at different ways to uh, work in different regions and kind of really more pushing it towards high design. But recognizing the parameters of what Habitat has to uh, accomplish, you know, in terms of budget, in terms of, you know, how the houses function, how they are good neighbors, how they impact their uh, kind of urban settings. Uh, so we're working in uh, Detroit, which is a really interesting problem. Mm -hmm. And it's been a really great process. Uh, we've really learned a lot from it. And, and we've, we've managed to uh, design a project that fits within their existing budget and what they're doing. Is it a single-family home or? Uh, yes, uh, yes. So I guess uh, no, we we got time to see if anyone in the audience has any questions. But I can keep asking questions too. <laughs> um, anyone? Do I have a question? Well, I'll ask you another question. Um, what are your clients asking for? What are some trends that you're sort of picking up on? I mentioned a little bit about you know clients not really knowing what they're going to be in a few years, and a number of projects, uh, particularly with institutions we've been working with, um, they're really not sure what what is going to happen in the next five years, and so they want to plan for a lot of different futures. Right. And um, so, so I think it growing. it makes you think in terms of how can you be flexible and how can you accomplish a lot of different things or how can you design something that can change over time or be used in different ways? I have to ask you something. I can't believe that I've just now gotten to it. They have an exhibition and book um, coming out on Skyways, <laughs> which I'm personally very interested in. So if, did you want to talk a little bit about that and how you got interested in, in Skyways? Skyways being one term for um, elevated pedestrian <laughs> networks or submerged pedestrian networks which is an urban phenomenon that you see quite a bit in the United States, mm -hmm. but also now in Asia, developing in Hong Kong and, and, du and um, uh, Mumbai. Mumbai and elsewhere. And it's, it's um, you know, there's a, there's a really horrible side to this phenomenon, and then there's a, an enormous amount of potential uh, within this kind of urban form. And it hasn't been addressed by the design profession. What's the horrible side? They, how they're what, built. How they're built. <laughs> the, you know, how in terms they of being dangerous? Or? No, no, no. no, no. The, just the ad hoc nature of them and how um. they separate from the street and the, the problems <laughs> they cause for the traditional form of the city with its street life. But it's, uh, one of the things that really interested us early on and when we started talking about these systems and thinking about them is they were at such a large scale. I mean, Minneapolis has an eight-mile system. You know, Hong Kong has 600 bridges. And nobody really plans for them, they just happen. And, but nobody talks about them. And then at the same time, we started to research them and really look at them in other ways and understanding that they really came out of the architecture profession, the avant-garde, particularly in the 50s and 60s, and that architects are always proposing these elevated interconnected systems. Mm -hmm. And they just migrate into the city and then you know, developers and bureaucracy bureaucrats take them over and they implement them kind of through code, not through design. 
So you're looking at sort of the benefits and pitfalls of them in, in this yes. book and, yes, and, and the this history. show. Yes, and the history. And there are examples like the High Line in New York, which is a wonderful park yeah. over the streets, and it's it, that is a form of uh, elevated pedestrian yeah. network. Mm -hmm. It really is. And so um, there, there, you know, there's many different ways that these things can happen, and they, we believe they will happen in one form or another in many cities. So how can we actually do that well? I think we have a question from the audience. Let me, give you, let me give you a microphone, thanks. A question about process. Your Type Variant House is one of the most well-thumbed books in our office, I know, and I really appreciate that you have all these construction progress photographs. I'm curious, with such a highly crafted residence like that, do the details evolve in the course of construction just in time, or were they thoroughly <laughs> documented prior to excavation? They were mostly um, developed prior to construction. So really the ones that impressive. weren't were the ones we're not showing you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, you, you guys are winning the um, AIA firm award this year. In, in a way, uh, building a firm is, is like a project in itself. Is there something uh, that you could tell us that was uh, that you're particularly proud of or that you feel is unique uh, to the culture of your firm or anything if somebody had to say you know what what is what is special about VJAA you know I, I think one of the key things is that uh, because I think we would call ourselves a knowledge based maybe that's a trite phrase but a knowledge based practice um, where where ideas are discussed in within the the office as a whole. So they, they're not um, divined, so to speak. They're, they're actually something we develop collectively. And we're the leaders, Jenny, uh, Jenny, Jenny me, and Nathan, um, do act as leaders when we need to. But we encourage the staff um, to, be, to be full participants in the development of ideas and to know, understand them. Because we think if, if you do that, the culture of the office is deeper and, and um, the work is stronger. I think something that's really helped with kind of uh, developing that culture is our office is made up of people who have had long-term commitments and who we have a long relationship. I think if we had a lot of people moving through our office, it would be hard to maintain the trust that you need to have that kind of a conversation. And I think the other thing is we moved from an older office building that had little rooms to a big open space where they're really was a lot of interaction and, and kind of well, casual conversation. So, so the space stable. we were in really affected that too, or our ability to have that culture. We also try to maintain the the ties stable. with our they employees as some come and go, but you know, for the most part, they're always welcome back if the timing and the, the workload is, is there. So we try to maintain that, um, that open door policy. Um, any other questions? I think we're running out of time. Well, I want to thank you guys, uh, Jennifer Yost and Vincent James from VJAA. That's how you say it. And uh, congratulations again on winning an award. And thanks for speaking with us today.